So uh, Dennis is a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences at the University of Michigan. He finished his uh, PhD in Professor Who's group, uh, also in the late 1990s. And his research covers various topics related to the design of millimeter scale computing systems and energy efficient computing. Uh, he's previously held positions at Synopsys and HP Labs and was a visiting professor at, the, at NUS. And his talk is entitled Towards Nanowatt Computing. Thanks, Thanks Vivek. <clears throat> so it's a great honor to be here at the invitation of uh, Chen Ming to speak at this symposium in his honor. So um, I'm going to start actually with this. Uh, getting close to the end of the day, so I, I put together one slide um, with a lot of content, but uh, one slide on things I learned from Chen Ming. Um, so I, I'm an academic too, so most of it will be colored by, by uh, how I am a faculty and, uh, compared to how you know, he was a faculty uh, as an advisor. So the first meeting I had was um, I was looking at graduate schools and I went to his office uh, visiting Berkeley and uh, I had taken some courses in, um, uh, in uh, semiconductor physics, 3-5 devices, hemp's, things like that, and I thought they were pretty fascinating. So I told him about this and this was in spring of 95. So he said, if you want a job, stick with silicon. <laughs> so that's the first thing I remember him ever saying to me. Uh, and I certainly... Yeah, and it's funny to see the talks today with Yi Chao's talk and some others with all of the 3.5 content that's coming in to the, the, the silicon uh, substrate, so to speak. So interesting, but uh, I, I like to tell that one to, to, to students, actually, in my classes. Um, so uh, the biggest thing probably is that research is fun. Actually, another thing is I came into uh, to Berkeley as a terminal master's student initially. So I was going to be there for two years, do a master's project in his group, and then move on to industry. So that was around 97 would have been when I finished. And, and around that time, things were really taking off in the valley, right? I mean, basically, all the students who came in with me in the mid-90s uh, had intended to do PhDs, and then they all fled to industry. And I did the other way around. I said, you know what, research is really fun. I'm enjoying what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm going to stay. So I kind of did things a little bit backwards there because of, uh, because of the, the group uh, dynamic, so to speak. Um, some other things, uh, I'll go through some of these more quickly. I know we're a little bit behind schedule uh, uh, right now. So you know, what to spend time on. One other thing that I learned was, and I, that I impart to my students when they're getting toward the end of their degrees, and they say, well, I don't know if I can take on another thing right now. I'm, I have to write my thesis. And I say, well, you know what? Your thesis is, is you know, no one's going to read that thesis, probably. You know? <laughs> you know, Don't spend time polishing your thesis. Spend time on new ideas and, and really you know, making the impact. So that's something that he told me that I, that I now tell to my students. Um, um, when I joined, uh, I, I don't know what year, uh, but it, recently Pinko had left uh, for, uh, uh, for Hong Kong, and, and so he, the group had been absor absorbed by Chen Ming, and he had a really enormous group, I don't know, 25 maybe students or something like that. And uh, so running, a, running group meetings or running a group in general with such a large group is, is really an art form, and I tried to basically model. My group is not nearly that large, but, but uh, in the way that he held multiple meetings, uh, in the way that he had all the students engaged uh, in, um, uh, in the other's projects and trying to uh, offer insight and comments and keep up with what everyone else was doing, you know, as opposed to just having tunnel vision on their thesis topic. Things like this, I think, are really important uh, as an academic and uh, something that, I, that I've taken to heart. And, and, and so what this one means is that, you know, <laughs> I didn't work on the FinFed. I was there during the FinFed years, uh, but I didn't work on the FinFed. But, but that's not what I mean here. What I mean here is that, you know, not every experiment goes as planned and becomes the next great, you know, contribution to the, to the field. And that's okay. Uh, you know, hopefully some things do go that route, uh, uh, and they do. But, uh, you know, you want to make sure the students maintain uh, momentum and, 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 and enjoyment of what they're doing. So make sure that even those projects that don't go all the way to, to, to a great result are still written up nicely, documented, and carefully, you know, pr uh, presented at a, you know, maybe not the first best conference, but, but at a reasonable uh, forum and make sure you get that out there. So don't just sort of dead end things. So that's something else. Um, empower your students early and often. So he got people engaged. This wasn't just me, it was everyone really in, in things like reviewing journal submissions early on and, le and learning that process. Uh, obviously doing student internships 
Uh, the funny story is actually when I when I take taken the position uh, in the spring uh, for the following fall from from Chen Ming, uh, he had, he said, well, you know what? I can actually get you a job at Intel this summer. There's an opening, and you can go and work out here. And I, I was in Michigan at the time, and uh, I'd already taken a job um, doing some more menial work, not actually designing chips or doing whatever I would have done at Intel. And I felt embarrassed to tell him that, but I said, well, you know, I can't do it. But uh, uh, but uh, but you know, already as a as a pre first year student, he was already get, you know landing me opportunities. So, um, so these are things that you want to basically give as much responsibility to students as you can. And then this last thing is just, uh, I still remember the papers. This was, again, 25 students. So it must have been putting out about 50, 60 papers a year probably at that time producing. And I still remember all the red marked up documents where I would give him a hard copy of my paper and he would bring it, he would bring it back to me with all these comments. So he did that for all the papers, showing that basically you, you can be hands-on in a large group, but you can also be hands-off and not be overbearing with, uh, with your students, and he did that uh, uh, perfectly. So, um, And then how to name a softball team. This, these were the hot electrons. So I, I didn't name this. This was a name before I came in. There was a team name called the hot electrons. So uh, you can see a few people here. Uh, Steven's there, Steven Tang, Bruce McGahee's there, Nick Linder who's not here is in there, and uh, Ye Tung, who is one of Sujay's first students, is in there as well. And there are a few other people who are actually good players, the ringers we brought in to help us win, that weren't necessarily in the, in the device physics community. But, um, but this, was a, this was a fun time. So hopefully this uh, softball is still going, hopefully, and alive in, 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 in EECS graduate students. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit now about, about you know, the main topic I'm here to talk about. Um, so uh, we've already seen a little bit of, of some of these things uh, early on. Uh, actually, in the last talk, we talked about power density and things like that. So I can go quickly through some of the beginning. But the way I see it, and, and actually Jan Rabai has a very similar slide to this uh, uh, with different names for some of these things. But the way, the way that we see it here is that there's three really interesting spaces in, in computing today. And we're talking about computing, not you know devices here, obviously. Um, but we've got the cloud and, and, and all the interesting data centers and things like that that are going on, um, where uh, the last talk talked about the, the, the highest performance computer in the, in the United States. Um, uh, mobile computing, which is an exciting area uh, we're all very familiar with. We all have a phone in our pocket. Um, and then this, so the sensors themselves, and I'm going to talk more about this here, this ubiquitous computing concept. Um, and these are all different, you know, different levels of performance, different levels of power consumption, different volumes. There aren't that many server processors sold. They're, they're sold at a very large margin and a very large uh, uh, cost. Uh, but there are a lot more cell phones out there, a billion units a year. Um, so in that middle circle, you might have a billion units a year or order billions of units a year. Whereas in the center uh, of the circle, it would be much, much smaller. And in the outer rim here, it's emerging, so it's not there yet. But you can imagine that that number can be much, much greater than billions because you've broken that one-to-one -one paradigm. A phone has a user. A sensor you know, in a building doesn't have a user. You can have 100 devices or 1,000 devices for every person on the planet. You'll never have that for mobile computing. You'll never have more than a couple. You know, I, I always say only CEOs carry around two cell phones, right? And there's only so many CEOs uh, on the planet. So, so basically, uh, the volumes can really be uh, exploding here. So the power problem was nicely illustrated in the last talk. So I'm not going to talk too much more about it here. Uh, we know supply voltages are stagnating. Uh, they're a little bit below a volt, maybe, but not a lot below a volt. Maybe you're talking 0.9. Um, I, think, uh, I think more realistically, they're still around a volt, typically, in, in modern high-end process, uh, high processors. Um, and then you've got this issue on the right where you say, well, okay, the density is still really improving. And this was the point from the last slide, from the last talk, so I don't need to belabor it. But the density is really doing well, uh, but the power density is, is not, and so for the energy density is doing worse. So basically, you get this paradigm, and it's been called dark silicon, if you've heard that term. Arm likes to use that term, among others, um, which is basically where I can fit lots and lots of transistors on a chip. Um, but I can't necessarily use them all to their full extent because the power consumption would be just too, too high. Um, and so then I have to basically only use some at a time, and that's this dark silicon. Some parts of it are, are, are dark or unused. So this is an interesting uh, uh, dilemma. Um, and so basically what we're doing is we're looking at the, 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 the voltage, uh, sort of the voltage knob and saying, well, where should we be? Uh, for these three different concentric circles of, of, mobile, uh, of computing landscape. And this is kind of, uh, these two plots qualitatively show energy per operation and delay, um, or the log of delay here, versus supply voltage. And the shaded region over here is the typical 
uh, operating region, the one volt typically today, right? The, the Intel, you know, high-end processors and so on typically operate in the one volt range and they give you a certain power performance and energy per operation, right? And this is just sort of where we, where we go, you know? Um, and then you say, well, if you look at it carefully, and you say, well, if I really wanted to optimize energy per operation and that's all I cared about, then I would just go to the left and I would walk down this curve here and I would walk down and I would get to the minima here. And the reason it inflects up is because you're getting so slow that the leakage energy uh, that you're basically integrating over every cycle starts to outweigh the dynamic energy savings of the voltage going down. So that's kind of why you see this minima here. Uh, the power will keep going down, but the energy per operation will not. So, so, so there's a minima, and it typically occurs below threshold, okay? Uh, although it can vary, but it typically occurs below threshold. We'll call this V-op, the optimal energy operating point or, or voltage supply. And the problem here is that your performance penalty is so enormous by operating uh, below the threshold voltage as has been known for a long time. Subthreshold operation is 40 year old concept that Eric Vitaz out in, uh, uh, in um, Europe had worked on way back then in the watch industry. So uh, we say, well, this is great for some types of things. Maybe that outer circle, even sometimes, the sensors, which don't require a lot of performance, maybe you could get by with that, um, but certainly not in mainstream computing. Now, if we do back off, you can see the trade-offs get more favorable because you're in a minima here, and it's not drawn completely to scale, but the minima is fairly shallow. So if I move over a little bit, I only give back a little bit of my energy savings, but I also gain back a whole lot because it's exponential and it's steep of my delay degradation. So if I operate somewhere in this sort of above threshold, but not much above threshold, and we'll call it near threshold. If we operate in this near threshold regime, we have a much better balancing point or trade-off point between the energy per operation. We're still much better than the one volt case, but our delay is only maybe, let's say, only, let's say, five or 10 times worse. Still pretty bad if you're talking about really high-end systems, um, but maybe tolerable given the speed of CMOS today, which we heard Ali talk about earlier uh, from the RF perspective. So, so you have a better trade-off point here, and we're gonna, I'll use this term NTC, or near threshold computing, to try to argue that this is really where uh, pretty much all of those concentric circles have an opportunity to work. Uh, and, and they're all power constrained in different ways. Servers are power constrained by cooling costs and things like that. The mobile space by heating, uh, you know, you don't want to put this really hot phone to your face and, and of course battery life, right? And sensors are even more power constrained just because the power, so the energy source is going to be so, so small on these sensor nodes. So for different reasons, they all fundamentally become power constrained. So if NTC provides a better power performance trade-off point, it should be applicable to all three of those. So I, I'm not going to spend much time on the, on the two inner circles, the cloud and the mobile space. But I will say there has been work, both by us and others, this is some of our work, on applying NTC to things that could be useful in the cloud or high performance systems. I'm using that as a euphemism here for high performance systems, where you care a lot about uh, uh, GOPs and, 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 and uh, tera operations per second, gig operations per second, et cetera. So this is a 3D stack using through silicon via um, de design that we did in Michigan uh, with stack DRAM. And, and, and I won't go into all the details here, but we did use near threshold uh, operating voltages uh, in, in the cores. These are ARM cores and also in the, in the caches here. And uh, we're able to get, this is a very old, very slow process. So this number is not enormous, four, four giga operations per second per watt. But compared to like an ARM high-end Cortex-A9 a couple years ago in 40 nanometer, it's within a factor of two, and we're being handicapped by at least an order of magnitude by the process. So it's scalable to much better performance points or energy efficiency points if you, if you were to take this into a newer process. And using through, to, through silicon vias is a pretty interesting opportunity there. And I won't talk too much about the right in the interest of time, but there are things you can do uh, to operate near threshold in the cloud and still get high, high performance. You have to do some tricks, but you can do that. And then in mobile, uh, a lot of it is you know, processing data in multimedia, image processing, uh, 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 video, pro you know, video decoding, things like that. We've done some things in, in a couple different applications here, like FFT accelerators. FFTs are, are big time, uh, and inverse FFTs are, are, are majorly used in LTE, uh, wireless communication standards. Uh, so we basically went and, and turned down the voltage, but did a lot of other tricks to try to bring the energy efficiency of a hardware FFT way, way up. And so we were able to do an 
an FFT, a, 1, 000, a 1024 point FFT and about 15 nanojoules of energy, which was quite a bit lower than what had been done before. Um, Intel is doing a lot of work in this area and at ISSCC the last several years they've published papers in the so-called near threshold voltage regime. Just like with the FinFET and renaming things uh, in Trigates, they also like to rename uh, a near threshold and they use the term NTV, we use the term NTC, but in any case the point is industry is starting to take notice of this and applying these aggressive low voltage designs uh, in higher performance spaces. But I think the biggest opportunity really lies in that outer circle, okay? And I'm, and and I'm going to talk, I'm going to motivate that with Bell's Law. Um, Gordon Bell, a famous computer engineer, he's actually at Microsoft now, uh, but used to be at DEC working on some of these early mini computers. Um, we, we, we've heard a lot about Moore's Law, obviously, we all know that really, really well, but Bell's Law is not as, as well known, but in the early 70s, uh, he did uh, point out that there seems to be a new class of computing systems that arises every decade or so. And these are the ones that you can identify uh, going all the way back into the early, early days of, of, uh, of computing. And, um, and so it's, it's interesting to look at, for instance, the, uh, uh, the scale of these things in terms of cost, the scale of them in terms of some other things that I'll get to next. But you can see the cost of these devices comes down, down, and, and down. And not only that, the size of these devices comes down, right? So these are very weird units when you get into gigamillimeter cube. But, uh, but in general, you can imagine that these mainframes are room-sized, and, and, and they were room-sized. And, and we all know how big some of the later things are, um, from PCs to smartphones. But the, the slope of this line tends to be about 100x every decade. So that's just a rough rule of thumb. Don't hold me to those numbers, obviously. But these are you know, aggressively smaller devices, computing systems, every decade. Um, and if you look at it also, you can see that the number of devices, and this is what I alluded to earlier, the number of devices grows from having you know, one huge enterprise may have a mainframe to one engineer may have a workstation to now households having computers and then, of course, people having phones, breaking that billion unit per year type number. Now, so the number, the volume gets higher and higher. So millimeter scale computing, or you know, uh, as the title here might say, nanowatt computing, is sort of this, uh, this next step. In, uh, uh, in Bell's Law. So the opportunity and challenge is listed here in this very wordy slide, but you know, I, it's my claim that these tiny, nearly invisible computing devices are going to revolutionize all these different areas that we care about. And, and Citrus, I know we're in the Citrus sort of area here, you know, these are the things that they care about as well, healthcare, infrastructure, environmental monitoring, security, et cetera. And, um, and I'll talk briefly about why it's been so challenging to get there. And I'll talk a little bit about our progress there, and then I'll wrap up. So the application areas, I think, are pretty well known, at least, at least the ones we can think of right now. Uh, I very much like the comment from the, from the morning. I can't remember uh, if it was Clement or who else, but said, if, if you build it, they will come. I think if you built cubic millimeter scale sensing nodes, wireless sensing nodes, then the number of applications is, is really limitless. And we can't necessarily predict what they will be today, but someone who is in the application space will figure out really interesting ways of using them. So I like that term here. Um, the status now, so, um, so in the late 90s, there was, uh, there, you know, the FinFET wasn't the only DARPA project. Uh, Smart Dust was another one that was pretty popular. And Chris Peaster, who is here, and I, I ran into him today, was, uh, was the one who coined that term. And, uh, and he made a lot of the really early progress on these, these complete microsystems at very small volumes, 100 cubic millimeter range. Um, but then, you know, he went off and he started Dust Networks and he um, uh, wasn't able to maybe continue all the academic work and, and there wasn't a whole lot of development there in the really, really small, complete wireless uh, sensing system space. And then recently on the bottom right is the work at Michigan that we've been doing to try to achieve this goal that we've, we've uh, built or, or developed for ourselves of a one cubic millimeter complete sensor. So this is kind of what we've been working toward. And the reason why it took a while to get there, even though Chris coined this term of, of smart dust so many years ago, and it's become a, a popular term and people think it's been done because it's a 15-year-old term, um, is, is just simply that you know, it's very difficult to make a small, small system that lasts for a long, long time. Right? Uh, the three most important things in real estate, and that's where I'm taking this from, if you ever talk to a realtor, they'll say location, location, and location. Right? So that's all that matters. In the same way here, if you want to miniaturize a computing system, you have to reduce the power consumption of the system. Okay? There are other issues, certainly. I don't want to necessarily belittle the integration challenges, but bringing down power, if you don't do that, you can never miniaturize. And if you look over here, quantitatively, very simple mathematical you know, calculations, you can find out, depending on your power source, 
uh, you're talking about if you want decade type lifetime from a uh, with a AA battery, okay, that's no big deal. Average power consumption can be in the 50 microwatt range. We can do that, okay? But if you want it from a, uh, a millimeter scale, thin film lithium battery, and I know Vivek has better batteries than this curve shows, but, but in general, um, you know, this is the order of magnitude we're talking about here, you have to get sub nanowatt type of average power consumption. Now you can duty cycle, so you don't always have to be transmitting RF, right? You don't always have to be actually doing anything. You can duty cycle, but bringing average powers down to that level is very hard. And that's the challenge that we've been trying to take up. And, and here's another way of looking at it. it it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. If you look at types of systems that we're used to seeing, like laptops, uh, iPhones, and, and some of Chris Beaster's early work on these tiny sensor nodes, if you look at the percentage of the volume being allocated to the battery or power source, you know, you spend, it's about a third here, it's a little more than that in the smartphones, and then if you look at some of the early work there, it's 90% battery. So at some point when you get smaller and smaller, you're 100% battery and you just have a battery, right? So, so basically you need to figure out a way to scale things down gracefully and together, right? So there's three ways to do this, at least three, you know, seemingly uh, clear ways to do this. One is make better batteries, and, and there's lots and lots of smart people working on that. It's hard. It doesn't improve that much. Uh, if you have a 10x better battery than what, it, what else is out there right now, then you're, you're going to be a billionaire very soon. Okay, So it's just very hard to do. Um, energy harvesting, of course, you know, that's very important. It's a hot topic. It has been for a number of years. And it's, it's an important part of these types of systems that we're going to build, these cubic millimeter systems. We have to harvest. Okay, no matter how good the battery is, we're not going to last 10 years on, on one charge. So we need to, re we need to recharge. But, um, but the problem here is we're a little bit limited, too. I have, I have slides I usually show with these, but I, it, because the talk is short, I didn't have the ability to show it. But think about it this way. If your solar cell efficiencies, if you're using solar, which is pretty much the best, if you, if you can use solar, you do, um, then maybe you're in 10% range or, or something like that for a small one. Maybe you're better than that. But let's say you're 10 or 15%. Um, so even if you, by some miracle you made a perfect energy harvesting solar, solar cell, you could at best do six to ten times better than that, right? At best. And uh, we know that's not even going to be possible. So there are fundamental limits to energy harvesting that we're you know, not super close to, but we're within an order of magnitude of, certainly. Okay? And the third thing is we just make, it the, make the circuits consume less power, make the actual microsystem itself consume less power. And here is where we do have the ability to move down in power consumption by that order or orders of magnitude to make that previous plot work, that, that battery plot work. Okay? And that's why we've been focusing on number three here. So here's a, a simple block diagram, very high level of all the different components that you have to basically address. We know when we're talking about power consumption, if you focus on the processor and you focus on the, the memory and you bring the power way down and you think, I'm done, then all of a sudden the other thing pops up and, and it says, OK, I'm dominant now. So you, know, you have to basically whack every mole, if you want to use that analogy, uh, and bring down the power consumption of every one of these components together. Because ignoring one or two means they're just going to stick out and basically kill your total, total power budget. So that's something that we've been trying to do. Um, we've been building systems in academia. It's, it's, a, it's a big challenge to build complex systems. In uh, academia, the integration challenges are significant. Here's one example of a device that we built for an intraocular pressure monitoring system to be put into the eye and measure uh, intraocular pressure for glaucoma uh, diagnosis and management. It is a one and a half cubic millimeter design or device, excuse me. There's three layers of uh, 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 three stacks in the system. You can't really see very well because of the, the picture is angled. Um, but uh, there's a battery in there. There is solar harvesting in there because it's great. The eye is meant to collect light, so let's use that. Um, and uh, it is an energy autonomous design, which means that if your eyes are open and you're collecting reasonable amount of uh, indoor lighting for 10 hours a day, then you are basically collecting as much energy as you're expending with the operation of the system. So it should last indefinitely, subject to wear out of components, right? Uh, so so it's, a, it's a nice system. It has a wireless readout, uh, short range, 10 centimeter type wireless readout. And then more generally, that's a very application specific example, but more generally we're building you know, cubic millimeter nodes for, for general sensing. And we're using this stacked platform and it's a little bit, archa you know, little bit, little bit quaint, archaic looking with these sort of staircase wire bonds. It'd be great to have TSVs kind of, but uh, we don't really have access to that unfortunately right now. Um, but in general, uh, we are basically using, you know, it's a heterogeneous system. If you want to have a really dense non-volatile memory layer, 
Uh, you could slide that in in a bare die form as long as you have the as long as you have the wire bond capability to, to bond up. Um, and, but you want to have your processor in a very low leakage older node, then you can do that as well. So the heterogeneity is a nice advantage uh, for us here. So, so, so basically, you know, to conclude. You know, the, I think, as I said before, I think the applications of these types of systems are really limitless. We just have to be able to build them uh, in a cost-effective manner. Uh, and then we can slide into the, that stack a layer uh, with a new sensing modality, with a different processor, a different type of memory, whatever it may be. It becomes very, very modular. Um, but the hardware has to get there. And I think the nanowatt challenge is what I do. I motivate my students and I say, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was the gigahertz race, right? The high performance AMD, Intel, IBM jumped in the mix, right? Uh, that was great. But nowadays, we, we really, I think the most exciting challenges in circuit design, in circuits, is to design the lowest power systems possible. Um, and uh, I, I, I glossed over a lot of the details on that, but I think that's where a lot of the fun is now. And, and here's the type of system we're trying to build here. Um, but in general, I think that it's a really exciting area to be in. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much.